Welcome to Codex History of Video Games. My name's Tyler Osby. And I'm Mike Coletta. And this week, the last installment in our history of Nintendo before video games. This is part five that Mike has been putting together for us. Uh, I'm excited to uh, to finally catch up to the Nintendo we know and love today. Uh, also, yeah. it's absolutely crazy that Nintendo has like a hundred years of history before that. It is. It is pretty crazy that in twenty, yeah, twenty two or actually two thousand was like a hundred and yeah, a hundred and eleven years, and so they're Sheesh. they're easily over a hundred and twenty. Oh man, they're almost at one hundred and thirty actually. Now I think about it. So no, they they already passed it. I don't know math, but anyway, it's it's been it's been a long time of Nintendo. So again, our primary source for these episodes is the history of Nintendo, eighteen eighty nine to nineteen eighty, from playing cards to Game and Watch by Florent Gorges. And I've looked up how to pronounce this guy's last name, and I'm pretty convinced it's Gorges at this point. But you know, apologies okay. if I get names wrong, as always. So here we go. Today is a little misleading with the title because we are going to talk about video games i know this is before video games but now we've hit video games with the history we, but we are going to so, talk about early video games right before basically before the stuff. nes is that kind of where we're at okay all pre-nes stuff so if you recall tyler a little game out came out in 1972 from this little hip indie studio called atari it was called pong do you remember that mm, never heard, heard of it, it? no uh -uh. You never heard of it okay well never pong heard was of a pong. really big game really big successful game right and mm -hmm. naturally, because it was successful, and this was the 1970s, and no one had any idea what was going on about video games, people just stole it and remade it and cloned it. And all the companies did this, including Nintendo. Sega and Taito had their own versions called Pongtron and Elepong. Nintendo, Dang, however... Not even trying to be inconspicuous with yeah, the, the stealing. Not even trying. They don't even care. They're just like, whatever. So... Nintendo, however, went a different route in 1977 and created their own home consoles with Pong on it. Like, that's kind of how they decided to do Pong instead of an arcade is they just made their own consoles. So these consoles were the first home consoles ever created by Nintendo. I don't think we've ever talked about them on the podcast before. And they are the Color TV Game 6 and the Color TV Game 15. That's what they were called. Both were released in June of 1977, which you may notice is a bit late to the Pong trend. That's like five years later. That's why they kind of decided to focus on home versions and not arcades. However, they got into this business by accident, Nintendo did. Nintendo actually has like the pocket calculator to thank for helping them get into the video game business by way of a couple <laughs> of different... You know, it's like that uh, Six Degrees to Kevin Bacon or Seven Degrees to Kevin Bacon. Yeah, it's like yeah. that. Eventually, you just accidentally make some video games. Yeah, you're always three degrees from pocket calculators when it comes to video games. Okay, so in this in this case, it was 1976. Mitsubishi was struggling with their pocket calculator business because they could not compete with Casio and Sharp, which are two very big electronic companies then. I still would think now, are Casio and Sharp, they had TVs. I don't know if they... Yeah, I mean, they're still around for sure. I, and I, they probably still make calculators, but uh, I don't... I don't. That's certainly yeah. not their main business. I also don't know if this is like the, how this relates to Mitsubishi's history making cars as well. So we're not even we're not getting into that. We're not a car podcast. But anyway, they decided Mitsubishi to break into the new video game craze. That's how they were going to compete because they couldn't get into the pocket calculator market. So now they're going to get into video games. And originally they were working with a company called SysTech in a partnership to create a console. Then SysTech went into liquidation and they sought out Nintendo for help because they needed another partner to help design and also market the system because Mitsubishi they like created and engineered the actual system itself but Nintendo manufactured it and marketed it since their expertise was in toys and games and this partnership spawned a like a total of five consoles and what we're going to call like the color tv series there was the color tv game six color tv game 15 that I already mentioned and then there was also the color tele, the color tv racing 112 color tv block kazushi and the computer tv game so those are the three other ones and we're going to talk about all of them today were these cartridge based systems or were they like 
Sort of like no. the Odyssey where they just had a bunch of games built in. No, they had the games built in, no okay. cartridges in sight. In fact, the Color TV 6, the first one we're going to talk about, didn't even have controllers. The knobs were attached to the console, so you had to like huddle around it. So uh, after learning their lessons from the Laser Clay Project, Yamauchi decided they had to compete with other companies on the most recognizable aspect of the business, price. So while other companies were selling home consoles around this time for 20,000 yen or more, Yamauchi insisted the CGTV6 and the CTV, CG, oh, excuse me, I, I always mix up these acronyms. I actually messed them up in my script. So uh, the Color TV Game 6 and the Color TV Game 15 needed to be priced at 10,000 yen or lower to make them competitive. So the price of the tele- Color TV Game 6 actually launched at 9,800 yen. And then a newer model of the Color TV Game 6 called the Color TV Game 6V which appeared a few months after that, would drop again to a price of 5,000 yen. So they definitely held up to the pricing standpoint. Dang. The Color TV Game 15 was by far better than the Color TV Game 6 and 6V, but it had a higher price point. But it was still 5,000 yen less. Like, it came out in June 1977 with a price of 15,000 yen. So that's 5,000 yen less than all the other competitors, which is huge. It's pretty good. Yeah, that still makes it pretty competitive. Yeah, and the differences were not only technical, but also in aesthetics as well. So the Color TV Game 6 only had six games, which is why it's the six, right? There's a caveat to this, too. Every game on the system was just a variation of Pong. It's like the Odyssey. Same. It's very similar to the Odyssey. <laughs> exactly, yep. And there were three variations, volley, tennis, and hockey. But because each one had a one and two player mode, that's six games total, right? Cause, ah. Yeah, see what they two did? Two player, that's a whole new game. Exactly. So the Color TV Game 6 also did not have controllers. The controls were knobs on either side of the console. So meaning you were very close to the TV and very close to your other player playing the game with you. So I hope you knew them well because you were close. Okay. And the (laughs) system launched with a white case at first, but soon after they switched it to orange case in the 6V model. And that's probably the most famous look. Like when you usually see a picture of the Color TV Game 6 online, it's usually the orange 6V model. Because that was really popular. In relation, the Color TV Game 15 was much more complex. Uh, that actually had controllers that players could take out of the docks on the console. And they were wired to the console, but you could at least stretch out a little bit. The Color 15 also had 15 games. Once again, most of these were variations of Pong. But there was one game aptly called Shooting Game where the player could shoot balls out of their racket instead of the racket bouncing the ball off of it so that kind of added a little bit of difference to there hardware wise this console was different because the color tv game 6 was actually battery powered whereas the color tv game 15 could run on batteries oh and yeah and it could also run except not battery it could run on an ac adapter as well so it could do both I don't know why I said it that way. But yeah, both ran on batteries, but the Color TV Game 6 could use an AC adapter. For For some reason, my brain like filled in the gap there when I was like, oh, yeah, that's different. Like when you said the same thing. When you say something that way, it makes it sound like it's a new thing. It's not a new thing at all. Yeah, my brain filled in the gap. They heard batteries, but was like plugged into the wall batteries, right? Yeah, but this one is plugged into the wall AC adapter for power, for extended gaming sessions, is how the book put it. I don't know, again, like when you want to play Pong for like just 10 straight hours. That's right. Isn't it, isn't it weird how we used to do that, though? Like, we, we talk about this as, like, the older games had a time to beat of, like, two or three hours, and yet we found a way to play them as kids for, like, 20-plus hours over yeah. and over Yeah, well, again, it also easily. helps when you are bad at them, too. That is true. Because I, I, I have gone back. There are sometimes I go back to an old game, and I go, wow, how was I ever able to do this at all? I'm like, well, this, was, this is so much harder than I thought. And then there are sometimes you go back to a game, and you go, Why, how did I ever struggle? Dude, you that's know? Mario Golf 64 for me. I'm so bad at it now. It's so hard. Yeah. When I go back and play Star Fox 64, I'm like, why am I so much worse now than I used to be when I was younger? And then, but but when I went back to Banjo Kazooie, I'm like, I must have dumped 100 hours into this game. And then I went back and 100% of Banjo Kazooie, and I, I did it in like six hours. It's because you're like, got everything. Player. And like, it helps that I know that game very well, but like, still. 10 hours is probably pretty generous for somebody who's never even played the game before. And I was like, I must have dumped 100 hours in this game as a kid. I don't mean to talk a big game, but there's a good chance if you if I booted up, booted up is a strong word. If I turned on my 64 and (laughs) 
had Tony Hawk's Pro Skater in, I could probably get all the tapes still on the first couple levels in one run. Yeah, in like one run. Yeah, I could probably yeah. do it too. That that was the that was the fun part for me. So, all right, back to the Color TV game 15, but this time it's the 15V. That's right. They released an update and it got a V added to the end of it. This actually had two different body colors on it, the 15V, orange and red, and around Christmas 1978, they dropped the price. That's right. You could get a Color TV game 15V for 7,500 yen, which is very What low. a deal. Yeah, a steal, even. Yes. The book really accentuates here how remarkable this was for Nintendo, because Nintendo offered two affordable color consoles. Keep in mind, these are in color, which is a lot of those consoles that were 20,000 yen were not in color. They were black and white. Uh, so oh, wow. With these, Nintendo took over 70% of the home console market at the time, which is pretty staggering to think about. The, the book states that the other 20 or so competitors then were sharing that 30%. So this is the first time Nintendo really took control and shook, in this case, the Japanese video game industry. Like they're the ones that are really like getting front and center because they just had their prices so low that people couldn't say no. And then the products were good too. So best of both worlds kind of so now we're going to move on to the next three consoles nintendo made in the 1970s and early 80s after this we'll talk more about what's happening in the world of arcades so we're going to get to arcades at the end of the episode because there's a lot of crossover here too which we're going to hit so just be prepared for that tyler okay i'm preparing you're preparing okay good first the color tv game racing 112 what's well, 112 was released in June of 1978 for 12,500 yen. Here's a fun fact about the gaming industry in the 70s in Japan at this time. A successful game, and I'm putting that in quotes, would sell 10,000 units, right? The Color okay. TV game Racing 112 was Nintendo's least successful console in the Color TV game series, and it still sold 160,000 units. Wow. Yeah. That seems like a lot. Wildly successful, even though it was technically the worst one. Hotcakes and gangbusters. Hotcakes and gangbusters. So originally it was priced at 18,000 yen, but was dropped to 12,500 before launch. So they made it a lot more affordable for people, even though it was still kind of pricey. Again, though, still like 7,500 yen cheaper than most other consoles at the time. There are a lot of interesting notes to talk about with the Color TV game Racing 112. First, you may be thinking to yourself, based on the numbering system of the previous consoles we mentioned, does the Color TV game Racing 112 really have 112 games? Nope, not at all, unless you consider minor level, color, and design changes to count as separate games. So this is even worse than the six games Pong. They're being pretty generous. Yeah. Really? There were only three games on this system. You either overtook a certain number of cars in a given time period, you would drive as far as you could without an accident, or you get points for zigzagging between cars. That's it. Every other change to make 112 games on the console was entirely visual. Wow. Yeah. and Or one and two player, I should mention that as well. You know, back in those days, we didn't know what constituted a game, you know? Yeah. We didn't know what, what what's a whole new game versus just a new level or just a new color. We didn't know. We didn't know. And also, when I was a kid in the 90s, my grandparents in Alaska got me one of those systems that, like, had 100 games on it. I might still have it, actually. And it really was the same thing. It was, like, variations of Tetris and variations of Pong and variations of Breakout. So, like, there were maybe, like, eight or ten games total, which is still pretty good, right? But yeah. each one had, like, ten variants, which is why, yeah, like this, yeah. which made it It's Breakout, games. but the blocks are blue. It's Breakout, but the blocks are green. There you go. Yep, Green Block Breakout. Classic. Two different games. With that in mind, though, I should mention that the game was fun. Like, the racing games on the Color TV Game Racing 112 were enjoyable, the biggest bummer by far with the console had to be that this console had a steering wheel on it, right? But only one. 
So if you played single player, you could use the steering wheel. If you played two player, you had to use controllers that were very similar to the color TV game 15. Oh, so the person who lost could always blame the other person's controller being better. Exactly. Exactly. That's the key. That's the it's easier. You have a real steering wheel. No, it's easier. You just have to use your thumbs. Dude, I will die on the hill that using the Wii steering wheel is harder than using the nunchuck and the Wiimote. And I was trying to explain that to my friends because I would be always stuck with the wheel. And they're all like, oh, man, we're winning all the time. And I'm like, yeah, it's way easier to play with a nunchuck and a Wiimote. OK, I didn't so know that was easier. up for debate. I thought everybody thought the wheel was harder. Uh, it's just easier. I think the wheel is a little easier for people who have never played video games before. Like, it just makes sense to just turn a wheel. Right. But like, yeah, the wheels it's not better. Cooler. Yeah, but what's crazy though is you see way. people online playing the Wii version of Mario Kart, and they would be like Golden Wheel, you know, like doing amazing things with it. So I don't know. Yeah, maybe there's some like exploits you can do with like the way because because it, it does a lot of stuff for you when you use the wheel. I feel like like there's a lot of like breaking and stuff that happens for you. So maybe there's a way to like exploit that. Like how how uh the like some games that allow crossplay between mouse and keyboard and controller, like the controller players dominate because the auto aim is like really generous for them anyway that's off topic from what we were talking no, about. i mean this is very much on topic because i'm mad about racing games and wheels okay so. <laughs> <laughs> and nintendo's <laughs> apparently been doing this for 50 years they've been doing this since the 70s people wake up everybody okay so <laughs> big conspiracy hat gets put on <laughs> another piece of random nintendo trivia by the way that you can impress your friends about after this podcast is if you're interested in what the game, the racing game on this color TV game racing 112 was like, you actually don't need to buy the console. You just need to buy WarioWare games because the racing game in WarioWare is the exact same game from this console. Oh, that's cool. I, I like that the WarioWare. I know well, a lot of the WarioWare games have uh, like the game and watch games in them because they're all really simplistic games that make it easy to do like a five second micro game yeah um that's cool i didn't know they had these in there too but it makes sense yeah if you you, you can see screenshots of this game online and you'll be like oh wait that's an warioware 100 percent. yep underrated game series this console like the others in 1979 had a price cut down to 5,000 yen every single one of these except for the last one had a price cut but the last one's a weird one which i'm very excited to talk about with you so <laughs> get ready for that all right here comes another console. This is the fourth one. This is the Color TV Game Block Kazushi. And I'm hopefully I'm saying that right. That's K-U-Z-U-S-H-I. That name alone would make you think it's an early GameCube, maybe. But alas, it is not. It is not a block-shaped game console. It is actually just a game console that plays a block game on it. It is, however, the first console independently developed by nintendo without the help of mitsubishi so this is technically the first truly nintendo console of all these ones on the list and it's also the first console to have the nintendo logo on the front of it the other three do not have the logo oh they all. were not easily identifiable as nintendo products no you have to actually they would say nintendo on the box and then on the bottom of the console underneath they'd have like a nintendo logo but it wasn't really obvious that it was a nintendo console if you got the first three this one however has the classic nintendo logo on the front of the console is it the like the racetrack logo with the circle around it yeah the, like the, the like the block current. letters with a little like oval shape around it yeah yeah the seal, the Nintendo seal, if you will. So this console was actually designed to play a port of an arcade game by Nintendo called Block Fever. We'll talk about Block Fever in a bit, but this was just a blatant clone of Breakout from Atari. Again, it's a time period where people are just taking other people's games and calling them something different. It is the way it is. We're going to get more into that at the end of the podcast today. However, this game was so popular that no one seemed to notice or care. And this was the 70s, the Wild West of video games. So no one cared that stealing was happening. This was an extremely <laughs> successful console for Nintendo, though selling over 400,000 units. Remember, 10,000 is successful and they sold 400,000. That's like everybody who plays games at that point in time in Japan, probably. Oh, yeah. And it was released in April 1979 at 12,500 yen. And a system like that's price 
with that many, that's a lot of profit for just Nintendo too. Keep in mind, no more Mitsubishi. No more just Mitsubishi. Nintendo. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Mitsubishi. They probably went back to making cars. They were done. They were like getting out <laughs> of the video game market. It that, that's kind of a, a like a a. I feel like that's a like a Japanese or Korean company thing where they just like they get successful in one area and then they just start making stuff in a totally unrelated area. Like Samsung makes telephones and also dishwashers. Hey, Nintendo made company, card like. and board games, went into love hotels. Who knows? You're right. You're not yeah. wrong. It's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing that happens. We've, we've discussed it on this very podcast in this very series. It's kind of an interesting way to do it. But every business like that grows right over time and like becomes something new. So that might mm-hmm. be what it is. Anyway, gameplay wise, it was neat because it was breakout, but it was also really customizable. You could change the ball speed, the number of balls on the screen and the bounce direction. There were also game modes like block lighter that had you aim specifically for these four flashing blocks on the screen. And you got a score based on how fast you hit those four fat like blocks without hitting the other non-flashing blocks. So it kind of had like some strategy to it. Oh, which is pretty there's a neat. little bit of skill going on there. Now here's the big news about the Color TV game Block Kazushi console. It was designed and carried out by none other than hero and friend of the podcast, Shigeru Miyamoto. That's right. Oh, yeah. This was his one of his first projects at Nintendo. This was confirmed in 2007 at a conference in Miyamoto's former art university in... I want to say Kanazawa is the name of the town it is in. But yeah, Miyamoto definitely took the lead and worked on this console and it was a, a big success for him. So it wasn't like it was it's not like he was first successful with Donkey Kong, you know, like he was doing some mm-hmm. things before then, which I thought was a really cool fact and point with this. Now, at this point, you may notice a pattern here because the price cut for this console was one year later, once again, in 1980, and it was cut down to 8300 yen Nintendo sold the computer TV game Block Kazushi, though, until 1981. I think it had like a little bit longer life than those previous consoles Mm -hmm. just because it was so successful. But this was easily their most successful in the color TV game series was the Block Kazushi. So our final console, though, we'll be talking about this today (laughs) is this is a weird one. It's just called Computer TV Game. It was released in 1980. No flashy numbers or gimmicks. This is just the computer TV game. Now, the retail price of this console was 48,000 yen. Which, according to historical data, yeah, yeah. According to historical data on the exchange rate of dollars to yen, that is around 211 US dollars in 1980 money. $211.80. So, in today's dollars, that's $785.74. So, now... Tyler, Dang. when I say computer TV game, what do you think that entails? What For that price point, what do you think this system did? For basically for what would be $700 today? Yes. Uh, I would want some, I want modular controllers. Like I want to unplug and plug in controllers so and separate controllers. I want it to come with both controllers, uh, assuming this is a two-player machine. It's obviously, it's in color, but the, it's not called color TV game like some of them were. So I'm a little worried that maybe it's not in color. Um, I also would assume it has some mo- uh, uh, game modularity in the sense of like uh, there's a way to load new games onto it, be that through a tape deck or floppy disks or cartridges, something like that. Like I want this to feel a little bit more like an Atari. What were they up to at this point? Probably the 5200 maybe. Um, yeah, I want it to feel, I know it's obviously going to be less than the NES, but I want it to be getting pretty close or at least comparable with what atari had at the at the time period well tyler you're you're not close at all because this did not have multiple controllers it only played one game it was played computer othello which is a board game and that's it for seven (laughs) hundred dollars that's all this did did it did it do well am i no no okay okay so this console is weird okay i i I wanted to like i was trying to trap you i think i trapped you a little bit i'm sorry tyler i'm sorry i did that to you but the point i'm making is this elaborate expensive console easily the most expensive of all of these consoles we're going to talk about today played one game computer othello othello is a board game involving an eight by eight grid now computer othello is important to nintendo history as that was the first arcade game they ever made we'll talk about that in a bit 
But this system that cost $785.74 in today's money only played this game. It was not worth it. So my question is, why did this exist? And there is a theory in this book. Some people believe that this console was made only for businesses, specifically spa inns in Japan, where tourists would need a game to play in between like spa time. And so they would play this with another person. Now, do you remember, Tyler, in the 90s when hotels had N64 controllers coming out of the TVs that you could play games oh, on? Oh, yeah. Those systems are wild, too, because they, they connect all the way back to, like, a, a back room that has all the games set up in it. And it, like, it's basically, like, a, a early form of, like, streaming a game to your, to your TV where, like, the console was not sitting there. It was, like, sitting in a data center at the hotel somewhere, and then the cable was beaming it back to your TV. Those things are really complex and cool, and there are a lot of great videos on YouTube of people who have, like, acquired these systems. Because, like, some of the games are different, too. Dude, I need to look this up. I yes, had no I idea that was a, that's how it worked. But, yeah, yeah. this is There's like There's a lot that. of videos. You're going to go down a rabbit hole. It's it's a pretty cool one. Okay. This is, this is like that, but with baths, essentially. It's just in yeah. between bath time. You could just play this computer Othello game. Now... Here's a little side note about this book. I love this book. It's it's one of my favorite books I think I've read in this because it's like a reference book. It's just all facts. But the, this is probably won't be the last time we use the book. But one of my favorite things about it are these little transition like translation mistakes that they make. So, for example, in this section, it says, quote, some specialists believed it was mainly set aside for marketing for professionals and tourism, end quote. And then it goes into the spa in business. But I'm like, specialists in what? Like, there's no details. <laughs> <It doesn't>, like, <laughs> like, are they specialists in tourism entertainment in the eight, in the 70s and 80s? I, I don't know, but I kind of love that. I, I kind of love that it's just kind of vague. And I think it's a translation thing. I don't think we should put any of it under Florent Gorges because he's the one who wrote this book in French originally. But mm. I just I just love this so much. So. And this this whole system, the computer TV game, is just such a weird idea. So the only big difference gameplay-wise with this system and the arcade version of Computer Othello is in the arcade version, there's a timer. So, like, you have to put more coins in, right? Obviously, mm, like, yeah. they just want to make you spend money. But this one, you can take as long as you want to play against your computer opponent in the game of Othello, which is funny, apparently, because in the book it says that the computer opponent is really bad at Othello, so (laughs) you would normally win. It said, quote, it didn't take long for an average player to floor the computer, end quote. So it was also not only was it just a system that played one game, but you could easily win that one game, which maybe, hey, you know, that's what it was designed for. Make you feel good before you get a spa. Well, they already got your money, so they don't need you to to be. They don't need to try to like manipulate you into spending more money. They already got it. Yeah, they're just gonna make you feel good because you're gonna win this game of Othello. You're gonna feel really good about it, and then you're gonna go get yeah. a massage, and you'll feel great. And, yeah, it's actually kind of a good idea. Now that I think about it. Okay, maybe we'll bring these back. Seven hundred bucks. What a deal! What a good deal. <laughs> Since that, that's so that's more than like an Xbox Series X. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's like twice as much almost. Because they're yeah. like almost 800 bucks, right? It makes you think, though, because wasn't there a time when home PCs were relatively like, I mean, this is early home PCs, that they would be just that expensive, if not more, and they would do very little compared. Yeah, home, home PCs would be this or even more expensive than this. I mean, they didn't do just one thing, but yeah, they would do very little by today's standards for sure. Yeah, it's just like word processing, maybe some sort of spreadsheets thing, and that's about it. So now yep, in games, of course. But they also had discs, like floppy disks, so who knows. Okay, so now, since this was most likely only really sold primarily to businesses, as you would likely guess, it is highly collectible. The book says this is one of the rarest and most expensive pieces of older Nintendo electronic games. I looked online for the current price of one of these just to see if I could find like what one of these sold at auction, but nothing popped up on auction sites. None of these consoles, all five of these consoles, are not on price charting eBay or the other sites I look at for, like, used games. My guess is, based on what you told me about your trip to Japan, Tyler, if the best way to get one of these consoles might be to actually go to Japan and get lucky at, like, a retro game store in the Akihabara district. Like, that's probably what you're going to have to do. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, and the, those places, I mean, they know what they've got, too, when they get something cool, so... 
you might be able to find them, but if they're this they rare, be really they expensive. Be, they might be really, yeah, really, might expensive. Be really expensive. Yeah, might be really expensive. I would, I, I, what I'm going to say is I'm going to consult with Matt in Japan. I'm, I'm curious. He'll I know. Think, I, think, I think he'll know for sure because he, he's, he's our man in Japan, Matt in Japan. Yep. Okay. So this episode is kind of hard to organize because we just did like Nintendo was making these consoles at the same time. So they were making consoles and arcades at the exact same time. So now we're going to talk about the arcade side of the business a little bit. All right. Once again, teaming up with engineers at Mitsubishi, Hiroshi Yamauchi originally wanted to make the incredibly popular board game Go into an arcade game. Now, Go, if you don't if you're not familiar with it, is a game that's much more complex it's even more complex than chess i believe right it's one of the things that like uh companies that are like look how good our ai is it'll beat a human at go like and that's really impressive i guess yeah and and that's a hundred percent also like what the problem was with this console is they could not make go on the hardware they had at the time the engineers at mitsubishi are like there's no way we can make this it's like way too complex for computers at this time so that's where Yamauchi decided to settle for Computer Othello in June of 1978, the arcade cabinet that would eventually be ported into the aforementioned overpriced computer TV game. Um, this was the first arcade title ever created by Nintendo and the first arcade machine created by Nintendo. Consumers would only have to wait, though, a couple months. Uh, actually, not a couple months. What's that? June. So five months into November of 1978. For the next Nintendo cabinet to hit arcades in Japan, that was another co-designed project by Mitsubishi, and that was Block Fever. As mentioned before, in the color TV game Block Kazushi, this was just another Atari breakout. That's all this was. So this came out in 1978, and then the color TV game version of it came out in 1980. So in the book, however, they talk about how the cost of engineering a brand new type of game is what caused many of these arcade manufacturers in Japan to clone American arcade hits, most of them from Atari. So that kind of justifies the stealing, I suppose, if you want to look at it that way. Sure. There's no bigger case of this stealing and theft than Taito's Space Invaders in 1978. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about here right now. So Space Invaders, if you're not familiar with this game, was a national craze in Japan and the U.S. You know, this was like uh, the coming, like the Pokemon fad in the 90s. That's what this was like. Yeah, Space Invaders was huge. Yeah, and all the game centers in Japan had Space Invaders. So naturally... Nintendo, like a lot of other companies, jumped on the bandwagon and made their own version called Space Fever and Space Fever Color in 1979. Now, Space Fever didn't do very well, mostly because it was exactly like all the other Space Invader clones at the time. It did not Dude. stand out at all. Did you ever have a Game Boy camera? I did have a Game Boy camera. Do you remember the Space Fever game? that was Yes, I, I think did. it was called Space Fever 2. Yeah. Oh, wow. wow. You, I, just I had a Nintendo camera and uh, a Game Boy camera, and I never put that together. You just you yep. just blew my mind, Tyler. Good job. It had a ball juggling game too. Yeah. You could like take your picture and put your face in it, and I think it had one other thing in there too that maybe was also uh, an old Nintendo game. I wonder what happened to my Game Boy camera. I have no idea what happened to a lot of this older stuff. But anyway, Yamauchi tried to innovate the clone of space invaders by calling it sf high splitter later that same year but it did it had small changes so what they did in sf high splitter is the aliens were twice as big and if you didn't shoot them exactly in the center they would break apart into two new enemies so it kind of added a little variation to space invaders but let's get real it was very much still space invaders the other thing the system did is it did allow the game to save the three highest scores as long as you didn't unplug the t- the screen and the ter- the table, <laughs> you know? Uh, oh, I should nice. say table, by the way, because all of these arcades are not cabinets. They are all tables that we're talking about today, like the kind you sit down at and look at, look down at. They're not... The, yeah, yeah, and may- maybe you sit across from somebody to exactly. play multiplayer, and you would, like, put exactly. your drink down on it or something. That's what all these are. So they, they it did allow you to save scores, but it didn't really do much more to differentiate it from space invaders so this all came to a head though when taito finally sued all of these other competitor clones including nintendo however since there was no real laws on this yet and video games were such a new field 
the case was actually dismissed. So Nintendo won, like all the other clones kind of won. And wow. this made for a very funny comment now in retrospect from Hiroshi Yamauchi that the book acknowledges beautifully here. So I'm going to read this full quote from Hiroshi Yamauchi. And before we get into it afterward, I'll, I'll give you some time to think about it, Tyler. OK, so here we go. Quote, concerning the Taito case. I think that in the field of entertainment, it is not desirable to give editors exclusivity to the exploitation of new game concepts. What should prevent us from copying a game's concept if if we want to? Like, what should prevent us from copying a game's concept if we want to? There's nothing we can do about it. And it is even a very good thing for the sector. It is indeed very beneficial to the actors of this industry to copy each other and glean inspiration from each other's games. This will enable us to develop the size and commercial growth of this sector together. Space Invaders probably suffered from this, but this contributes to developing the entirety of the computer creation sector rather than developing games in secret, away from competition. I think it is very important to communicate with each other and to show other editors our steps in programming development. End quote. Does that sound strange to you, Tyler, from Nintendo? That sounds like uh, something coming from the uh, a, a new entry into a market who has not dominated that market yet and would really like some advantages in helping to dominate that market. Um, I don't entirely disagree because uh, on on like a very like deep sort of philosophical level, I'm like, how can you copyright an idea, right? Like it's just a thought in a head. Like there's like, you know, you can get real weird with it. Um, So like, I don't necessarily disagree on the surface, but that definitely sounds like uh hey, we're trying to make games. There are other people who are ahead of us in making games, so can we please just copy them for a little while until we figure our own stuff out? (laughs) Exactly. And that's exactly the the, the point the book makes, is that this is Nintendo before they became the powerhouse that we kind of all know them as. Because as you remember... They would not say that today. Exactly. Not at all. In 80s and 90s, like we got... With Donkey Kong... like Well, Donkey Kong's coming in 1981, right? But then when they're like so obsessed with holding on to their first party not letting third party developers in and keeping everything a secret but that's when they're in power right so they're not in power right now so you 100 percent nailed it that's exactly it it's just really funny that this came out like this now after this the book mentions some partnerships with other companies one of those unlikely allies was sega at the time of arcades so nintendo got the license to distribute a sega game in japan Meanwhile, Sega was in charge of distributing the Nintendo arcade game Space Firebird in Europe. They also had a partnership with Namco that led them to licensing Bomb B and Cutie Cutty Q, like which were two big pre-Pac-Man Namco games. So they are working with other companies at this time as well. The only original hit at this time for Nintendo in the arcade space was called Sheriff in 1979. Have you ever heard of Sheriff, Tyler? I don't think I have. So Sheriff, if you saw it today, you'd recognize the gameplay style. You are in the middle and there's guys all around you and you have to shoot them as they come in and they're shooting you. Okay. Right? Like, so like asteroids, but... but Yeah, it's like early, it's like what we would describe as early, 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 early bullet hell. You know, those, the, the bullet okay. hell style of games. A little like, bit of they're... vampire survivors in there. Exactly. So that's this shooting game where you move the stick and fire enemies was like very much about skill and reflexes. And therefore, it was pretty popular in arcades. Like people got competitive about it. And it had a sequel, Sheriff 2, that just didn't take off. But the original Sheriff not only should be remembered for its commercial success, but this is also... The first Nintendo game with a scenario or a story attached to Ooh. it. Granted, the story is very light. You play as a sheriff whose fiance was kidnapped by 16 rascals. <laughs> I like, <laughs> hey, I just like the term you rascals. You know, anything is innovation at this point. I'm, I'm down. You're fine? You're, that's all you need? Yeah. That's all. Yeah. No, I, I mean, in a, in a world where no, probably nobody had even thought to add stories to a game before, uh, this is a step forward, you know? That's it. That's what you need. You just set the scenario. You you let your mind pretend the rest. That's all you need. Yep. So there are some other Nintendo arcade games that released in 1980 and 1981. Honorably mentioned here, we'll say Space Launcher, Space Firebird, Hellfighter, F- Hellfire, and Radar Scope. Those games were mostly well received, but not like the commercial success that Sheriff was. The next game that would take 
a sheriff's cowboy hat shaped crown that sheriff had would come out <laughs> until 1981 and that had a skyscraper a jumping man barrels and a gorilla and i think we all and that know game is game mario is. party 2 <laughs> you're not wrong that's it it is mario party 2 <laughs> the know. sheriff hat there, there was nothing <laughs> until mario party 2 <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's that's kind of where we're going to leave it for today. I mean, I think we'll come back to this book again for sure. There's certainly a wealth of information, especially in regards to like the older board games. The way the book's laid out, they had this history session up front with all the card and board game stuff. They showed all those board games. Most of the book is like a showcase of products. And then I just picked up this last part that was the history of arcades and stuff like that and like laser clay shooting system and things like that kind of stuff. So there's a lot more in here and there's also other books in this same series that were by also by Florent Gorges that kind of goes after Game & Watch into like Nintendo stuff and early NES. If I can find those books, we'll probably keep going with this because if this is something people are interested in, I feel like the history of Nintendo in general yeah. is probably is an interesting thing for people. If we haven't done it already. Yeah, we've kind of talked about a little bit about those. We haven't just gone to We've touched on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's really about details, but there are other things, though, like we might pick up like this is like kind of out of print and expensive. But again, if you want to pick up this book, it is The History of Nintendo, 1889 to 1980, from Playing Cards to Game and Watch by Florent Gorges. It's got amazing photographs in it, and those don't translate to podcasting, so we aren't even talking about them. So if you wanted to look at it, you can check it out. It's a very expensive book. I think I got my copy for over 100 bucks. It's out of print. So just Dang. so you know, yeah, it's pretty expensive. With that, though, Tyler, what you been playing? Well, headline for what I've been playing. Well, we'll get into it in a second. First of all, we finished Quake 2. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah you did. and I did, right? That was in the last. We didn't talk about that last week. No, that was we this didn't week. Talk we about, we didn't talk about that last week. No, we did finish Quake 2, though. Okay. We, we did it. We didn't go into the extra stuff. We just finished Quake 2. Yeah. We should do the extra stuff because I was looking at the achievements and we can get the full 1,000 gamer score. And all we got to do is just play through all the other missions or all I the other that. things. That's it. And we'll get a full. Yeah, there's no like weird achievements in there making you play differently. It's like if you just play the whole thing, then I guess you got a 1,000 gamer score. So we should do that. Also, I hear they're pretty good. So nice. uh, playing that. Still playing Sea of Stars in between things. Um Really loving the 16-bit RPG aesthetic of that game. I think I talked about it last week. But the big one is Starfield. I put uh, like four or five hours into it yesterday, uh, having a, a great time with it. I fully expect to like p go hard on it for a little while and then stop immediately and never touch it again. Um, and that's okay. Yeah, I got it on Game Pass, so I'm not that worried about it. But I'm having a lot of fun with it. Have you been playing Starfield? What have you been playing? I have not touched Starfield because I told myself this weekend I would beat Baldur's Gate 3. I am at the end. I am at the part where it says you can go, you should get everything else done you want to get done. And I've passed that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm in the final act here. You passed the point where of no Where there's return. no take backsies at this point. Yeah. The only problem is I hit that point at like midnight last night. So I didn't want to keep playing because I was really tired. I am trying to beat Baldur's Gate 3 before I jump into Starfield because I'm worried I won't beat it at all. So tonight might be the night that I beat Baldur's Gate 3 if I can get if I can win all the fights and do everything I need to do. You know what I mean? But yeah, I, I'm really enjoying it. I haven't touched Starfield, but I am excited because I have an original Xbox One. I've talked about this on the podcast. It has a hard time is an understatement of playing games. <laughs> and I learned, though. I can play Starfield through xCloud, and I think I'm going to try it because I have fiber internet. Oh, yeah, that might work. That might work well. I mean, I would I would play it on your computer and see how it runs, and then I'd also try it on there, too, unless you're just looking to play it on your TV. I mean, yeah, I was going to play it on my computer first to make my character, and then I was going to see if it has cross saves on it Xbox. It does. It does have cross saves. It does? Okay, cool, because then yep. I could play some of it on my Xbox, and then I could play some of it on my computer. I think that'd be really neat. Yeah, I think that game would probably work really well on xCloud. Oh, nice. Sweet. I think it's, I mean, now that I have good internet, I think it'll work pretty well when I have that crazy upload download speed that I got with Fiverr. Yeah, it is limited to 30 FPS on Series X. So if you want it, if you think your computer can do better, run an HDMI cable to your TV. That's what I'd say. Oh, yeah, I but could just do that. Test them both. Test them both. Yeah, I'll try them both because I, I just like being able to sit and play these kind of games. 
Yeah, I, I, that's what, how I've been playing. I've just been playing with an Xbox controller, and I just ran an HDMI cable to my TV. Nice. But yeah, that's kind of all I, be, I got on the docket this week for playing games. I did. I'm going to post it in the Discord. I made a silly purchase, Tyler. Oh, I can't wait to hear. I ordered the three Burger King games off of eBay. Yeah, I have sealed copies of them here. Sealed copies? You're not even going to play them? I, I, I don't know. I, I was going to try to get used copies, too, because if I get a used copy, they're like a dollar. But these three yeah, sealed copies cheap. were 10 bucks total for all three. So I have Dude, Sneak I... King, Big Bumpin', and Pocket Bike Racer all sealed Xbox 360 games. And I don't want to open them because they're a piece of gaming no. history. It makes me so happy that those games are still dirt cheap because, like, they're kind of a meme game now. And, I mean, they were, like, five bucks, I think, when they sold them at uh, Burger King, so they weren't ever, like, really expensive. But I could just see it being this thing where not very many people bought them because the games are fine, but they're not, like, particularly compelling. But then, like, years later, they become meme games, and suddenly their price is through the roof. Like, there's a lot of, like, bad DS games that just, like, for some one reason or another became a meme game, and now their price is just, like, through the roof. And I'm like, I'm just, it just makes me really happy that these games are meme games and they're still dirt cheap. So I think I've lucked out. So Sneak King is complete is price, like sealed is like six bucks. So I See, think I did a, okay. That's like how much it was when it, when it was at Burger King. That's awesome. I'm looking them up right now. I'm looking up Pocket Bike Racer as well. To see. Yeah, do they have online play? Because I can play, I could play Pocket Bike Racers with you or Sneak King. I don't have Big Bumpin'. Let me take a look here. Pocket Bike Racer. Okay, it's there. So new in box price is still $6. So it's gained a dollar sealed price, it looks like, for each of these. Yeah, well, I mean, inflation, they probably should be more. Because this was like 2006. Oh, complete price for Big Bumpin' is $1.50. Big Bumpin's rare. Oh, see, that's the worst one, I think. That's why I don't even have that one. Sneak King is, is really where it's at. Fun fact the it is it the whole time it has been hovering around two or three dollars since 2013 and then as of this year like just recently it's gone up like two dollars from four to six bucks dang it's doubled in price what an investment i think people are jumping on the meme train and i i know for a fact too that there's going to be more stuff about this coming out because no clip talked about how they're doing a thing with this yeah, they're doing a documentary on them. I'm very interested in that. Me too. I, I just wanted to pick them up. But I also am uh, on the hunt for more retro games. And I have some gigs in eastern Washington later this fall. And Ooh. I'm already talking to some of our friends, some of our mutual friends, Tyler, about going to pawn shops and trying to find old copies of games. Because I went to a really good game store. I should I should shout them out, right? We could do that. We can uh, we can do that on our podcast. Yeah. We can do whatever we want. So it's called Top of the Line Games in Portland, Oregon. I went there for uh, just because I was doing a show down there one night and I got Wave Race 64, but they had a good collection of stuff. And they were the ones there that told me like, hey, if you're really trying to find these, because I was looking for some games that are like hard, hard to find. Like I've been on the hunt for Snowboard Kids 2 for months now, and I refuse to buy it online because online it's like 70 bucks. I'm like, this got to be. A yeah, then you're going to pay. Yeah, there, there's it's always more fun when you feel like you got a deal exactly and i think that they told me they're like go to pawn shops and thrift stores in small towns and so for me it's like eastern washington is where it's going to be that a I lot of small towns kind of yeah but i'm going to pullman in november and we have a buddy in pullman and i'm going to go tell him like hey on our off days we need to go try to find this stuff <laughs> is that video game store in the moscow mall still there I don't know if that's video still game there, headquarters? but he told me there's some pawn shops in Lewiston and Idaho and Clarkston, Washington, okay. which are two towns next to each other on the border that we could probably hit up. I'm going to plan on going to those. Nice. I'm looking for Snowboard Kids 2, and I'm looking for Legend of the River King for Game Boy Color. Those are the two big games. Awesome. Those are my, my, two, my two white whales, if I was Ahab. <laughs> I always go to Sunken Treasures when I'm in Richland. Sunken Treasures is a great store. I've been there, too. Shout out to Sunken Treasures. Yeah, all the all those video. I I have not been to a video game store like a retro game store that I have been upset with. Game Gurus in Seattle also great. Check them mm-hmm. all out; they're so good. But I think with that, if you want to send us an email, you can do that at codexhistorypodcast at gmail dot com or go to codexpodcast dot net. That's our website. It's got all of our links on there. You can go ahead and see us there. With that, Tyler, you want to say bye to listener? Sure thing. 
Goodbye, listeners.